السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله we welcome you all back to fortifying faith which is a monthly series that the Muslim Youth of St. Louis Mistal has been doing uh, and mashallah we have had four sessions so far with various speakers um, discussing various key critical issues uh, that Muslims face here in the West. Alhamdulillah, we've covered doubts. Uh, we had a Seth Fahad Taslim, we talked about doubts, the types of doubts, um, and a general framework to dealing with doubts. And then we had uh, Ustad Mubin Vaid, who talked about the LGBTQ issue. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we went into a lot of detail on that. Uh, and then we had Imam Dawood Walid uh, for activism uh, and sacred activism in particular. And Alhamdulillah, in our last session, we had Dr. Abdullah bin Hamid Ali from Zaytuna College uh, and we dealt with the issue of slavery in Islam. Uh, today, alhamdulillah, we are joined by a very special guest, uh, Mufti Muntasir Zaman, uh, based in Dallas, Texas. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh, uh, for joining. Uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, I'll read out his bio but uh mashallah uh, i think uh, many of the students knowledge and many of the ulama mashallah they're aware already of Mufti Muntasir's work uh but inshallah just so we can know him and appreciate him accordingly uh Mufti Muntasir Zaman graduated from the Alimiya program of the Madrasa Arabiya Islamiya in South Africa he then completed the Ifta program uh, and a course specializing in the field of hadith he holds an MA in Islamic Studies from the Markfield Institute of Higher Education in Leicester, England. Currently, he's a full-time instructor at the Qalab Institute teaching advanced hadith studies. He writes articles, books, reviews, and translations of classical Islamic literature. His publications include a study of the methodology of Sahih Muslim, a guide to Arabic manuscripts, a translation of Dr. Mustafa Adami's introduction to Sahih al-Bukhari, and an examination of hadith scholarship in the Indian subcontinent. His forthcoming monograph examines the conflict between hadith and science. Um, for those of you that like to read uh, and that like to, to explore more, he writes at hadithnotes.org. Uh, and there's a lot of different type of content, both hadith related uh, and otherwise. Uh, but his expertise is hadith. He's written on hadith. Um, he has uh, published um, Dr. Mustafa Alami's introduction to Sahih Bukhari along with his footnotes, his research. Uh, and mashallah, as we said at the Qalam Institute, he is uh, an instructor there, so he's engaged uh, in teaching as well. The reason we have uh, Mufti Mudassar today is to share with us his expertise, um, his research in the field of hadith. And uh, always myself, and I'm sure Mufti Mudassar can relate, uh, in any community role that you're in dealing with the youth, uh, dealing with with your congregation in your masjid, you will be asked at some point uh, either uh, methodological questions about hadith. Uh, people will hear something about the uh, the validity of the hadith sciences. Or was it really documented well? Is it just hearsay? Kind of those type of questions. And then we'll, you'll obvious, often hear people run into understanding different hadith that seem to be problematic. Uh, but as we know, this is not a new concept uh, from the beginning of our tradition, our scholars engaged, Imam al-Tahawi, uh, you know, Imam al-Shafi'i, from the beginning of our tradition, the scholars engaged, they critically uh, analyzed hadith in various different ways, the various different aspects, and we have that rich tradition with us, but we want to take that tradition and bridge it to our confusions, our doubts, our questions today. And so, uh, uh, Mufti Saab, uh, getting right into it, uh, what do you think are some of the key concepts that need to be cleared as kind of the foundational principles or the foundational concepts that need to be kind of set in place in order for us to really get into this discussion. Commencing this talk and the conversation in general, the most important thing for us to bear in mind is as Muslims, we consider twin sources to be at the focal point of our belief. When I want to derive my faith 
laws, theology, there are two sources that I look towards. First and foremost, I turn to the Quran, see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells me in terms of my private life, my public life, my theology, my interactions with humankind. And the second source is the prophetic authority, the life, the works, the legacy of the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These two are at the center of every individual's endeavor to arrive at the divine, to arrive at Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the authority of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not something willy-nilly just thrust onto us, rather it's something we learn in the Qur'an itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala time and again reminds us that the Qur'an is a revelation that was sent to a particular individual who had the task, the duty of conveying it to others. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ Allah says to the Prophet السلام, that we have revealed unto you the remembrance so that you can clarify, you can elucidate for mankind the contents of this message. So we have the Qur'an, a source of guidance for all of humanity until the end of times. The Qur'an itself is telling us to turn to the Prophet ﷺ for this guidance. So the Prophet ﷺ, throughout his 23-year mission, starting in Mecca, persecuted as a minority, then he migrates to Medina, the fledgling nascent Muslim community slowly, gradually grows until the Arabian Peninsula comes under the rule of Islam. And within decades, it becomes the leading power of humanity, of the known world at the time. By the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, as Professor Hamidullah mentions, about two thirds of the known world was under Muslim control. So it shows that the Prophet ﷺ left behind a legacy and that legacy was embodied in the lives of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So when I espouse belief in Islam, what does that mean? That simply means that I believe in the Qur'an, I believe in the commandments of the Qur'an, and I embody the lived experience of the Qur'an is found in the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, that life, that lived experience is what we plan on discussing today, hadith, as it was recorded by his companions. And before we commence, obviously, it's important to consider two points. One is the idea of hadith and the other is the sunnah. When we talk about hadith, we're talking about individual data points, how the Prophet ﷺ did X, Y, and Z, and how it was recorded through methods we're going to delve into shortly. But then you have the sunnah, which is the normative practice of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, to um, clarify a distinction between the two is when we talk about the sunnah, we talk about what were the final actions of the Prophet ﷺ. What were those things which were meant to be conveyed, practiced, and enshrined into the law? And then you have the hadith, which in certain instances it's recorded, but it may not be the final dictate, it may not be the final commandment. So you have this body of, uh, of statements, deeds, and um, what have you, known as the hadith, and then from that body of information you have what is the sunnah, what is the lived experience. So um, to open the conversation, I think it's just important to understand the role of the Prophet Sallallahu in the life of every believer. And uh, before I hand it back to you for uh, uh, you know, continuing on with the conversation, uh, I think it's very important and it's very striking. When we study Islamic history, the one thing any astute, any uh, keen reader of Islamic history will point out is definitely there were schisms, there were divisions, politically, theologically, legally, uh, societally. There were many forms of divisions. And um, that could be a topic in and of itself, a deep dive into Islamic history. But for our purposes, it's important to bear in mind that the different schisms, regardless of how much they swayed from orthodoxy, you will be hard-pressed 
to find a single example of someone who openly denounces, as a Muslim, openly denounces the prophetic authority. The only difference, however, is arriving at what most accurately ref reflects the prophetic legacy, they'll disagree. But no one until the you know recent modern era would you find someone saying that the status of the Prophet Ali is immaterial. Rather, regardless of how much they differed, no matter what the issue was, at it within their epistemology, you'll find that prophetic authority played a key role. And when we understand that, it makes us you know, aware of what the role of the Prophet should be in every aspect of our identity. So, um, Sheikh, um, that with those few key points in mind, um, obviously, we all, as you said, almost everyone until you know the, the recent modern history understands that the Prophet them, that was his status, that was his position, and that's what he came to do. Uh, but very quickly, and I know this discussion is beyond the the the, the, uh, the ability of this one lecture, but very quickly, um, Muslims often they're hit with a lot of different. Uh, accusations, a lot of different questions about documentation and preservation of hadith, right? Before we come to the issue of the content, the actual preservation, is this really what the Prophet said, right? And then there's there's so many different aspects of that. So what are some, some key points for like a beginner student of knowledge or someone who's just getting involved with this? What are some key points that they, they have to keep in mind in terms of the preservation of the hadith and the actual authenticity, the reliability of the hadith corpus in general? So when we talk about hadith, we understand it as the statements, actions, and tacit approval of the Prophet ﷺ. Obviously, we're not arriving at this directly from the Prophet ﷺ. We have written records, we have collections of hadith, which we open up, and they say that the Prophet ﷺ did X, Y, and Z. The question that is often brought up is, when was this information documented? Is it true that it took um, a century or more to, you know, officially record these, uh, you know, this legacy of the Prophet ﷺ? So, as basic as we can present this, let's think about the Prophet ﷺ among his companions. These people who surrounded themselves with the Prophet ﷺ were willing to sacrifice everything near and dear to them just so that they can attain salvation in the afterlife and support the mission of the Prophet ﷺ in this life. So people who are so dedicated to an individual would, by necessity, record his life because it means something to them. And the way they recorded his life varied. And for our purposes, let's think about four methods. Let's visualize the Prophet ﷺ one day comes to the masjid and he addresses his congregation. How is it that what he imparts to his congregation 1400 plus years ago eventually reaches us? Now that's the journey we want to go through. So the Prophet ﷺ would teach his companions and they would preserve his teachings through one of four methods. The first method, which wasn't too common, but nonetheless existed, was to write down and document the concept of writing down. And it must be acknowledged uh, at the offset that this was not that common. You had a few people, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, for instance, a person comes from Yemen, for instance, and has it written down. Um, Ali radiallahu anhu. You have scattered instances of the Prophet ﷺ saying something, and then it is written down. That's the first mode of preserving the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ in our hypothetical scenario of him coming to the masjid and teaching and lecturing his congregation. The second is through memorization. And I want to focus on this method particularly because... When we study history, we have a tendency of imposing our paradigm, our worldview onto the past. We're living in a predominantly written tradition. Whereas the past was not like that. Paper was not accessible. 
um, written material was not accessible, ink was not accessible, not everyone was literate. So the most common method, particularly among the Arabs, was to preserve information through their memory. And obviously when someone does something consistently, that technique is honed, that technique is improved and advanced. So they were impeccable in their preservation of things through their memory. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum would listen and they would recall what the Prophet ﷺ said, even if it were a few years later that they transmitted it. So some people perhaps wrote it down. Some people, they preserved it through their memory. Now, this was initially how it happened. After they would leave that gathering, a few other things would happen. Number one, some of them would go and relate to others what they heard and those others were unable to participate. Famous incident. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, were, he had a friend, and they would take turns to attend the lessons of the Prophet alayhi salam. One day Umar would attend, the other day his companion would attend. And they would exchange information like that. So even those who were absent became a means of preserving the teachings of the Prophet alayhi salam via those people who were present. And this was the advice of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, Those who are present convey to those who are absent. And then those who were present, they may have memorized it, but what if their memory was weak? They may have written it down. What if they weren't great at writing? Fair enough. The final method and a key method of preserving the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ was to put it into practice. So if the Prophet ﷺ told them that after you perform your Maghrib prayer, perform two rak'at, if he told them whoever recites X, Y, and Z will be rewarded such and such, then the best mode of preservation was go home and immediately put it into practice. And this is what we find in their lives that whatever they learned, they may have not learned a lot in one sitting, they learned a little bit, but they immediately put it into practice. So the Sahaba, they instituted these different uh, methods, they've uh, invested in these different channels to take the teachings and to preserve the prophetic memory. Once the Prophet ﷺ passes away, these Sahaba, they go far and wide to Iraq, to Syria, to Egypt. You know, eventually at some point, the Muslims reach Al-Andalus, to Khurasan. Now, the, uh, obviously, it didn't expand that fast, that rapidly, but nonetheless, the Sahaba, they go far and wide. Now, as they're going to going from place to place, they are not only going there to you know, live happily ever after, they have a mission in mind. As we learn from the seerah of the companions, they go with the intention of da'wah, of imparting the message of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, these companions would now teach their students their students would do with these companions what the companions themselves did with the Prophet ﷺ. They would write down the information or they would memorize the information, go and convey it to others and then practice it themselves. And as generations passed, you eventually see this becoming a concerted effort of preserving the memory of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, granted, as political schisms, as theological divides began to surface, people began fabricating. People with poor memory began trying to um, relate information. And truth be told, false information now was being ascribed to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Muslims at the time, they realized that this is something that we need to deal with. And you have the famous statement of uh, Ibn Sirin, um, and others, Al Isnadu min al Din, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Al Isnadu min al Din, Lawla al Isnad, Laqala man sha'a ma sha'a. And then you have the statement of Ibn Sirin who said, Inna had al ilm adinun, that this knowledge that you're learning from the companions, it's a trust. Make sure you're conscious of where you're getting it. So once this information is consolidated, it spread throughout the Muslim world as the frontiers of the Muslim empires expanding. The Muslims think to themselves, what can we do to ensure that this information is preserved? What is true is recorded. What is false is separated. They instituted two methods. And uh, before I proceed, uh, Sheikh Hamza, do let me know if I should stop or slow down. Keep going, Sheikh. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, enjoying it, mashallah. So they instituted two methods. 
The first is known as Isnad, the chain of transmission. Because when the companions heard from the Prophet ﷺ and they relate to their students, there wasn't this question of false ascription. They're the companions. Uh, we don't doubt them. Now, you're talking about a few generations, uh, you know, separating them from the Prophet ﷺ. Not everyone came with a correct intention. People wanted to fabricate hadith for political means. People wanted to, um, you know, get financial gains, so they would fabricate hadith. So you have people around, uh, you can say, the closing of the first century of the Hijri calendar, they, they tell themselves, okay, what can we do to make sure that this information is vetted? So they came up with a concept that was that was present before, but now it's becoming official, known as Isnad, Al-Isnad. We hear about the chain of transmission. So if somebody were to transmit a hadith, they weren't able to just go out and tell people, I heard the Prophet say this, or the Prophet said this. Rather, you said that in a masjid, somebody would stand up and say, listen, where did you get that from? This very famous incident where uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he hears Urwa say something, a famous tabi, and he says, I'lam ma what you're saying, make sure you know what you're saying. Give me evidence. Who did you hear this from? And then he says, I heard it from so-and-so who heard it from this person who heard it from the Prophet So now, slowly, people are being cautious in transmitting what they heard from their source. They wouldn't just go ahead and say it without verifying who they heard it from. Now, if that same lesson, our hypothetical lesson in that masjid is being told to somebody about a hundred years later, they wouldn't just accept it. They would tell this person, all right, tell me, who did you hear it from and who did he hear it from going back to the Prophet ﷺ? And once he gave that information, they would feel comfortable in accepting it and saying, all right, fair enough, this is from the Prophet ﷺ. However, that wasn't enough. What if somebody comes around and says, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, I heard someone say this, and he invents a fictitious, he invents a fabricated name. How are we meant to identify truth from falsehood? They, they, they instituted a different method known as al-jarhu wa ta'adil, the science of narrator criticism, where if someone were to narrate, they better be ready for their lives to be investigated. If I open my mouth that the Prophet said X, Y, and Z, I better be ready to have dozens of people come and study my life to see whether I'm fit to say what I'm saying. So using these two methods of verification, first asking for their source and then analyzing whether that source is reliable, they were able to say, okay, this information reaches 100% of certainty. We're going to call it Sahih. We're going to call it reliable. We're going to call it mutawatir, whatever the term is. These terms may have not existed then, but in their minds, they had these terms. And somebody else would say something and they would say, okay, you know what? This is fabricated. We can't trust it. So they would separate it. As this information was slowly um, passing on through written work, uh, through uh, writing, through oral transmission, within 125 to 150 years, all this information that's being transmitted is now documented into the form of books. So you have a scholar like Malik ibn Anas, the Imam of Medina. It's been roughly a hundred years since the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And this tradition, this uh, all this information that's circulating, he now puts it into writing. Imam Abu Hanifa from Iraq, he puts it into writing in the form of Kitab al athar Ma'amar ibn Rashid, he starts to write it down as well. And then you have the, the, the movement of writing hadith. And these hadith are written in different genres. Some people are writing only hadith. Some people are writing hadith and the statements of the, of the tabi'un. Some people are including verdicts of the different uh, regions. And this carries on for about 200 years. And then you have these famous scholars come to the scene, such as Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, Ibn Majah, Abu Dawood, and many others, Ali ibn al-Madini, Yahya ibn al we can just name, names upon names. They, they come to the scene and now they start recording with absolute rigor all of the hadith and they tell us with thoroughness what is reliable and what is unreliable, what you can accept, what you cannot accept, and they have different gradations. 
once these collections are you know put together they are in written format then for centuries thereafter these books are preserved these books are vetted manuscripts are written and copied different recensions surfaced and eventually you have thousands of copies of these books and in the year 2021 a person comes goes to the local masjid opens up one of these books and reads that hadith when he reads that hadith it is that same hadith that 1400 plus years ago the prophet ali salam told his congregation in our hypothetical scenario brilliantly put and so i'll just summarize here your, your first key point which i think is very important which you uh basically made the point of how initially uh the general method of transmission was oral transmission in general not just uh when it comes to the hadith sciences due to uh you know how you mentioned about paper was not readily available and, and whatnot and i think an interesting example that that comes to mind when i was learning and one of my teachers uh gave was that how in order that seems very far-fetched for us to understand but within our life within our lifetimes uh there's been certain changes that actually uh the coming generation would not understand one of them being um memorizing phone numbers right so if you go back 10 15 20 years especially for those uh that are the older generation uh they used to memorize regularly uh dozens of phone numbers you had people's phone numbers memorized nowadays if someone gets a new number you might not even know the phone number of your spouse or the phone number of some of your family members because the whole dynamic has changed with the whole uh you know with your phone and you simply type in the name and you pull it up uh and so now if you try to memorize even one phone number it seems like a burden but there was a time where things were different so with time things change uh you know from the beginning from that oral uh to that written tradition uh but Sheikh, uh keeping uh all that in mind I wanted to ask in particular, um, when it comes to um, the average Muslim and they are presented with a hadith and they're not sure how to answer it. And most likely it's because there's something in the content of the hadith that either, um, you know, someone has uh, taken some understanding from it or either they find it difficult to answer due to the current culture, norms, etc. that we're in. Uh, I want you to tell us about some of some key points to keep in mind when a person is confronted or when they come across in such a hadith. What are the steps they should take? And I want you at the beginning to tell us about a little bit about your personal journey, because at some point, uh, you know, you were, uh, you know, you simply you grew up here and, you know, you were a beginner student of knowledge. And at some point you used, you came into similar uh, interactions and then, you know, you went through an entire process of getting into this field. So from your personal journey as well, what can you share with us? that can help us kind of navigate this? So um, I, I remember growing up, uh, the local you know, imam would, during the Jumu'ah khutbah, deliver. And given that he wasn't you know, born and raised here, certain things that people here may consider difficult to comprehend, he would just share it. And I remember a number of hadith, particularly from the seerah, about the way the Prophet Sallallahu did certain things. I remember hearing it and as a high schooler, I would think to myself, you know, this is hard to believe, this is hard to accept. You know, you know, a, a very famous incident is where the Prophet Sallallahu during some of his wars, like the outcome that people had to die for accepting or rejecting the message. And when he would say this, I would sit down and think to myself like, wow, this is really hard for me to um, understand. And this was before I went out to study. And then I go, I study, and you begin to realize the nuances behind a lot of these hadith. And personally, I like to tell everyone who finds it difficult at times to, you know, not to, they don't feel like rejecting the hadith, but the initial knee-jerk reaction is one of discomfort. That's normal and that's fine. Rather, that's a sign of our faith. Because if something doesn't trouble us, that means I really don't care about my faith. When my faith, I, I find it difficult to square it with my worldview. It's a sign that I have this intention of trying to square it. It means something to me. And even in the lives of the Sahaba, you'll find instances where the Prophet ﷺ would say something and the Sahaba at times would be would you know would display astonishment 
the Prophet ﷺ once said something, and the, the Sahaba asked, Ya Rasul, did this actually happen? An animal talking? You know, it, there's a famous hadith, and the Prophet ﷺ says, listen, it actually happened. If Umar and Abu Bakr and Umar here, they would believe it. Not that they rejected it, it's just that when they heard it, their initial reaction is like, Ya Rasulullah, did this actually happen? So it's, it's completely normal for us to hear something and it agitates our conscious, that's perfectly fine. What is not fine is readily dismissing something that does not fit into our worldview. I hear something. The Prophet ﷺ got married to Aisha radiallahu anha at a young age. The Prophet wasallam said that the sun sets beneath the arsh, the throne of the of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hear these things and if I feel discomfort, perfectly fine. But if I hear it and my first response is, man, this is nonsense. There's no way I'm accepting this. This is untrue. That should not be my reject. Uh, that should not be my reaction. First and foremost, because I should learn some humility. Whether it's Islam or not Islam, whatever the case is, when I hear something, I should be humble enough to accept that perhaps I am misunderstanding this. All right. So as instead. Uh, instead of getting to specifics, when we talk about problematic hadith and what is problematic for one person may not be problematic for someone else. I still remember when we were studying, when I was studying in South Africa, we were in like Dawrat al-Hadith, you know, we we're going through the books of hadith and we would have Sunan Abi Dawood open. And the teacher's reading and the students are reading through the hadith and some hadith, the teacher would stop us and he would say, this is the explanation of the hadith. And I would think to myself, you know, nothing too difficult to understand. It's quite straightforward or it's not too problematic. But I can see that the teacher himself feels a sense of discomfort and he assumes we feel the same discomfort. Other times we're reading, we're reading a hadith and in my mind, it's, it's just not settling. I feel like, you know what, I need some more explanation. The teacher wouldn't say anything because in his mind, that's not something that needs attention. It's straightforward. So what's problematic for one person can be completely straightforward for somebody else. And what I'll ask you, Sheikh, to, to clarify, just so we know about what problematic means as well when we're saying that. Is that, is that in a negative condition? What does that word actually mean when you say hadith is problematic? Sure. Right? Problematic would mean that it raises questions in my mind. So I hear that the Prophet ﷺ said that the son, you know, prostrates by the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It raises a question in my mind, okay, scientifically, this seems difficult to understand. How is it that the sun, we know that the sun doesn't go anywhere. We know that this, let alone go under the throne and what we see as night, someone else sees a day and, you know, basic questions about astronomy. And it's a bit unsettling. And I just need some clarification. Not problematic in the sense that the Prophet ﷺ said something false. No, it's something that requires further clarification. So the, the first thing, I guess, the most important thing that you, you know, the point you made is that um, when it comes to uh, having an unsettling feeling, that's OK. Um, and that's actually a sign of a person's faith that they're concerned and they want to reconcile between their faith and their worldview. Right. So uh, once we get that out of the way, how should someone approach this? Right. They have a hadith. It's on, it's on their screen. What do they do now? Do I just, you know, hit a Google search? Do I just, can I contact anyone? Who do I contact? How do I go about? Uh, what are some steps that I should take, especially practically speaking from your, from your experience? In an ideal world, whenever we find something unsettling, the best is to go to an expert and have it clarified. But that obviously is not feasible for every individual. So I generally, for my own uh, practice, I try to keep four guidelines in mind. Whenever any hadith uh, comes my way and I find it unsettling, I keep four key guidelines in mind. Number one is what we can call the limits of human reason and experience. Number two, the importance of context. Number three, the usage of figurative speech. And number four, the distinction between what is impossible and what is improbable. These are four basic guidelines that we need to bear in mind anytime we come across a hadith that we find unsettling. Number one, the limits of human reason and experience. And what I mean by this is, 
human beings just by nature of who we are we there's a limited scope of what we can do and what we can perceive we know that we have our five senses right so i can see i can smell i can taste i can feel i can hear but the senses of mine are limited there's only so much that i could do for instance if i want to taste with my eyes i can't do that i can only use my sense of touch to touch I can only use my sense of tasting to taste, right? So even these senses themselves are limited. Then I have human reason. I have my rational faculties with which I'm able to discern things. So if somebody comes to me and you know shows me my phone and I'm not able to reason, I can touch the phone and feel it. I can smell the phone if for whatever reason I can even taste the phone. I can do these things, but without my rational faculties, I can't think about the production of the phone the function of the phone these are things that are beyond my five senses so we know that our five senses are limited that's where our mind comes and helps navigate uh things beyond our five senses but just like our five senses are limited our you know rational faculties and our human experience is also limited that's where the divine uh guidance comes so where my human intellect comes to a stop beyond that is divine um the divine scripture now the reason why that's important to bear in mind is when i read something that i find unsettling i need to ask myself am i feel am i being unnerved and unsettled by something that is beyond the scope of my ability of critiquing and now let me make this more specific we hear a hadith that when the adhan is called the devil shaitan you know swiftly runs away and passes wind some people may and actually have uh, heard this hadith and scoffed and laughed at it and said this is ridiculous what does it mean that the devil is passing wind well whoever is critiquing this hadith they need to take a step back and ask themselves okay why is it unsettling Okay it's unsettling because I find the imagery of a devil passing wind very difficult. Okay, that's fine. But why are you rejecting it? Because it's unsettling. What's your evidence? You you're limited to the seen world. You don't know what happens in the unseen. You can't do what they call qiyas al-ghaib ala shahid al-qiyas al-shahid ala al-ghaib. You cannot, you know, analogize the seen world with the unseen world so what i'm trying to do is critique something that is beyond the scope of my experience beyond the scope of my ability of critiquing so when i see a hadith that tells me in the afterlife something's going to happen or the devil does something or something that's in, of the unseen i can feel unsettled but i don't have the right to reject it because on what grounds am i going to reject it if i have an academic uh reason to do so so be it but if it's simply on the grounds that it's absurd or it doesn't make sense well i don't have the right to do that because it's beyond human experience that's just one example and we can delve into this but just shortly remember the first thing i try to do is just remember human experience is limited human intellect is limited there are things beyond that so um those are some key points sheik um when it comes to uh if you're dealing particularly uh with hadith of a particular genre and i know you've done some study into uh you know scientifically questionable hadith uh, i know you've written a paper on that and you've kind of uh, dealt with that also uh in, with the, the issue of evolution obviously we don't have the time to go into the details uh but what are some uh you know what are some uh, some basic points to keep in mind dealing with that particular genre uh, of hadith because that's obviously very often brought up okay sure um and i would add to that even i'm not going to delve into this too much but even the issue of uh, gender that could be a big issue of science and gender i think these are at the uh, heart of what really agitates uh muslims today uh, just quickly to get into the gender question not to detail but i think um what we fail to understand is context right when the prophet ali salam spoke we need to contextualize his speech we need to contextualize his actions There are often times the Prophet Ali Sallam would say something and we jump onto the bandwagon of wait this is sexist this is problematic not realizing that let's not focus on a specific part let's think about the message that the Prophet Ali Sallam is trying to convey to other people 
the Prophet ﷺ, he gets married to someone at a young age. Now, for me, that's difficult to fathom, but the moment I read history even a little, I'll realize in pre-modern societies, that was perfectly normal. The Prophet ﷺ talks about gender relationships being more strict. For me today, that's difficult to fathom, but the moment I realize that, okay, back then things were a lot different, it becomes easier for me to um, accept. So just quickly, just wanted to touch on the issue of gender. Context is very important. Now, coming to the question of science, there are a number of hadith uh, at face value seem very difficult to uh, reconcile with our modern consensus of science, right? Let's take an example of how the sun prostrates beneath the throne. W what does that even mean based on our understanding of anatomy? That Adam alayhi salam was 60 cubits, 90 feet tall. How is that even possible? So there are three ways that scholars have tackled issues of this sort. The first is to try to offer a figurative interpretation because the Prophet ﷺ, when he spoke, he spoke like an ordinary human being. He wasn't speaking like a scientist. And we shouldn't always take his words and try to, you know, dig deeper than what they were intended, right? So when the Prophet ﷺ was speaking to Abu Dhar, and he said that the sun goes be prostrates beneath the throne of Allah. Why am I taking that literally? Rather, that was a figure of speech. The Prophet ﷺ is basically saying the sun prostrates because everything else prostrates. We learned this from the Quran that the trees and the stars prostrate. It's just that their method of prostration is different. So prostration, I have in my mind, is a very specific act. But in this context of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is referring to subservience, submission. So he's not saying that it physically goes and it prostrates. Rather, he's saying that the, the sun is submitting to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once we realize that the Prophet ﷺ was like any other ordinary human being, in terms of the fact that he would speak with normal speech, then we begin to realize that, okay, he was using hyperbole. He was using a figure of speech, metaphor, similes. It's absolutely normal. So the first thing is what is considered scientifically problematic may not even be an issue of science to begin with. The Prophet ﷺ is not explaining to us astronomy. He's basically telling us that just understand that the sun is submitting to the will of Allah, just like we submit to the will of Allah. Other times, the, the, the scholars, they try to answer it. Uh, the objection by saying, you know what, it's possible that the hadith in question is just not authentic, right? There seems to be this tension scientifically with this hadith. And then when you revisit the hadith, it seems to be that the hadith is not even authentic. There are a number of hadith that would say that um, thunder isn't what you think it is. It's actually the angels roaring or the angels um, using a lash or whipping. Now, I start investigating into this hadith, and I'm like, wait, perhaps the hadith is not even authentic to begin with. So again, the source of discomfort may not be there. Another thing, very important, is sometimes we may be giving too much credit to science in that what may simply be a theory, what may simply be an assumption, is not true. And if history tells us anything, the philosophy, the history of science tells us anything, notions of what the world around us even mean, what the cosmos are, these things change all the time. Newtonian science, gone. Like, like so many things that we think about the past, we at, during their time, it was seen as, wow, you know what? This is something to hold on to. This is what we're supposed to aspire towards. And today we look back on it and laugh. So maybe what I find scientifically problematic, I need to look back and think, perhaps I'm just giving too much credit to science. And last but not least, I don't want to go too long on this point. The last thing I want to say is, look, we need to be humble in our approach to knowledge in general, but to hadith in particular. Something is difficult to grasp. Something is difficult for me to reconcile with my worldview. So be it. There are so many things that at some point was difficult for myself to fathom. And then years later, I think about it and it's completely normal, right? There are certain things that the Prophet ﷺ said that people in the past thought, wait, this is awkward. How is this possible? That uh, when the hour comes near, 
a person is going to talk to his shoe, a person is going to talk to his lap. When, when, when people hear things, they're like, how is that even possible? I mean, today, that's absolutely normal. We have phones. <laughs> we talk to almost anything. So um, the point is, I think the last point is, let's be humble and realize that I'm not going to die. And hopefully the world's not going to crumble if I simply be humble enough to say, as of now, I don't understand this. I'm simply going to relegate it into that category that, you know what? It's fine. I'm going to get back to this at a later point and focus on things which appeal to me. And obviously, I don't just leave it there. I try to get some clarification. Um, Sheikh, uh, to, to wrap up, and we have a couple of questions. We'll take them, inshallah. But uh, one last thing that I wanted to kind of put here is that when it comes to the Quran, we know that every ayah in the Quran is uh, authentic in the sense that its transmission is accurate. When it comes to hadith, like you said, the authenticity of the hadith is a big question. Now, when it comes to... Um, at times when, as you said, it's not always easily accessible to have uh, an expert. When it comes to dealing with the authenticity of the hadith, is the hadith authentic or not? Uh, what are also some, some parameters, some important guidelines to keep in mind, especially when uh, a person is confused? Many times they find true rulings on the hadith. Is it, uh, is it authentic or what particular grade of authenticity? And then if it's, if it's weak or not, and then accordingly establish uh, a foundation on that. So the science of hadith is extremely complex. And truth be told, I don't want to sugarcoat this, but it's something even scholars require years of detailed study before they can even pass a ruling on it. So my suggestion would be to err on the side of caution. Always read books where the work is already cut out. For instance, like Riyadh al-Salihin, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. Uh, collections of hadith where if you have comfort in the, um, the the qualifications of the scholar or the translator, then you go with whatever comments they have in the footnotes. I, I, I don't feel um, navigating through just a corpus of hadith blindly is advisable. Rather, what should be done is specific collections of hadith that were written where the work is cut out. As I mentioned in the opening, Hadith is raw data. This hadith was related about the Prophet ﷺ. The context, the understanding of it, the application of it, there's a lot of work and there's a lot of nuance behind that. So it's not everyone's job. So one of three things. Number one, I sit uh, by the feet of scholars and you know try to learn. If that's not for me, that's perfectly fine. Number two, I read the literature where the work is already done. Fortunately, in English, you'll find a lot of up-and-coming translations, commentaries, um, hadith collections that, you know what, they provide, you know, glosses and notes that can help me, hold me by my hand and push me through. And last but not least, if I don't have these qualifications, let me just either, um, you know, put this into a category that I will eventually get clarification for, and I'll go to uh, get that clarification. It's just... I don't, I, I just, I don't find it um, not only appropriate, just academically feasible for someone to even attempt to arrive at a grading of a hadith if they don't know the basic tools of um, al-jarhu wa ta'adil, um, isnad criticism, uh, basic concepts without knowing that you can't grade it. But like I said, a lot of the work is already cut out for us. Go to the authentic collections of hadith. Go to the books that were meant to for certain topics. Uh, scholars whose writings you know we're comfortable with, we rely on. We can use their works, and um, I think that would be the best thing to do. Now, some things are not in our hands. Let's say, for instance, I'm just scrolling down Facebook, my Facebook feed, and I see a hadith, and I think to myself, okay, um, is it reliable? Is it unreliable? Um, first thing I need to ask myself. Is, has it been cited somewhere? Is there a citation provided? And that is one thing that's above the average that we can do is sit down and even if it takes me 15, 20 minutes, sit with the scholar and the scholar will say to uh, the, this individual that look, if you see Sahih al-Bukhari, if you see Sahih Muslim, if you see Riyadh al-Salihin for instance, if you see Sunan al-Nasai, it's not 
in the latter case, it's not 100% guaranteed, but at least you have a degree of confidence that this is something you can rely on. While on the other hand, you see some random names, you're best off not saying that it's false, but just be cautious. So one of the questions uh, we have from our viewers is uh, recommended reading material in English. Uh, and it, I'll add to that two specific, either the, the, the codification of hadith, the, the preservation of hadith, and secondly, just general reads you'd recommend for people's different needs. For example, spiritual needs uh, that you have in your house, maybe with your family, or just general um, in any halaqa that you're in. What are some uh, hadith collections, especially in the English language that have been translated, uh, if, and in any particular editions, if you would recommend uh, for usage? So to answer the first question about the more academic aspect of hadith, um, hadith codification, documentation, uh, I would suggest two authors whose works uh, I've personally benefited from. And um, one I would say is for an average audience and the second for a slightly more advanced audience. Uh, the first for an average audience, I would definitely suggest Dr. Mustafa Al-Azami's works. Dr. Muhammad Mustafa Al-Azami, who recently passed away, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's done tremendous work uh, in the field of hadith studies. Uh, how were hadith documented, particularly his book, Studies in Hadith Literature, which was his uh, PhD dissertation, is a phenomenal starting point for anyone who wants to be more aware of the documentation of hadith. And then there's the works of Dr. Jonathan Brown, which is slightly more advanced, uh, his book on hadith is a phenomenal starting point to get a bird's eye view of the hadith project from different perspectives. And you'll sell, the, I don't think there's an equivalent to that book in the English language in terms of its breadth and in terms of its um, ability to uh, gather both Western, the Western tradition of studying hadith as well as the Islamic tradition. That's the academic side of it. Um, the second is more for general consumption, the different genres of hadith. So to do this, I need to first identify what are the different genres. If I'm looking into just hadith itself, if I just want hadith related to a particular topic, the go-to is always Riyad al-Salihin. Uh, if somebody is new to uh, hadith or is interested in reading, Riyad al-Salihin is the... Uh, ideal book to begin with because Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala he's done a phenomenal job at organizing the hadith based on relevant chapters and basic basic commentary to the point you can say there's no commentary there so if I want just the hadith itself it's a, a great starting point um, if I'm looking for um, something spiritual um, there's a nice book um Again, it's like I said, not everyone is interested in every genre, but one, if I'm more into like the spiritual side of things, there's a nice book by Mulana Shifali Tanwi. It's called uh, A Sufi Study of Hadith. It's really nice. Um, all the hadith related to spirituality. Ibn al Qayyim has a number of books uh, related to, um, uh, you know, that are related to hadith and spirituality as well. So that'll be more of the spiritual side. If I'm looking for like a nice academic read, um, which has been um, translated recently. Um, Imam Nawawi's commentary on Sahih Muslim has been translated by Q Publications. Uh, Dr. Adil Salahi, he's done a good translation. It's not complete, but it's a good introduction to this, um, you know, the academic study of hadith. And then you have other, you know, we can sit here talk all day about different types. There's the 40 collection hadith collections. You have um, hadith um, on particular topics, hadith on um, you know celebrations, hadith on the Prophet's life in Mecca, Sirah. Uh, there, there's a lot. But if there's one go-to that everybody should have, it would be, in my personal opinion, would definitely be Riyadh al-Salihin. Sheikh. I think that about uh, wraps it up. Uh, and if you want to give us some final words, some final pieces of advice, or just some concluding uh, remarks, inshallah. Sure. Um, just to wrap it up and to keep this relevant to the topic of today's conversation, problematic hadith, 
the thing that really gives me comfort whenever I'm faced with something that raises questions is I'm not the first to encounter these hadith. If you study history, you realize that many of the same questions that we are grappling with today and many of the same concerns that we have, the greatest minds of Muslim history also had in their mind as well. The hadith about the sun prostrating beneath the throne, the hadith about the, you know, the height of Adam alayhi salam, the hadith about you know, the Prophet's interactions with other communities that sometimes may be difficult to comprehend. These same questions you will find Nawawi, Ibn Qutayba, Shafi'i, Ibn Hajar, these great names, they've, they're tackling it as well. But the difference between the way we often tackle these questions and Muslims in the past tackle the questions is as though we're just, we're, we're like moving in two different directions. Oftentimes we feel that, you know, scholars of the past were scientifically illiterate. We think that a lot of the basics that we know of, they were unaware of. Absolutely not. They, they were, yes, some of the technological advancements they may not have had, but mathematically, scientifically, a lot of things they knew. Yet the role of revelation in their epistemology, in their source of knowledge, was very different than what we oftentimes relegate for revelation. For us, it's the world that is around us. And revelation is a secondary thought. If I can reconcile the two, so be it. If I cannot, I'm just going to you know, put revelation to the side. Let me go with what science has to say, what modern ethics has to say, what, uh, what, what's, uh, what's in at the moment, what's normal. Uh, that's what I'm going to go with. Whereas if you look at, it, look at it in the past, scholars like Ibn Hajar or Al-Ghazali or Ibn Taymiyyah or Shafi'i, Abu Hanif, all of these names, for them, revelation was a source of certainty. And yes, with different degrees of variation depending on it, but generally speaking for them, revelation is what I want to hold on to. We're living in a very postmodern, disenchanted, secular world where religion is often supposed to be private, if not even part of someone's life. And those forces that constantly bombard us, we need to say no to that. We don't accept your paradigm. We want an enchanted world. We want a world where there is the divine. We want a world where, you know, there is someone we worship. There was a person who we follow. There, there, there's, um, there's a religion, a lifestyle that I embody. And when we're able to view the world from that perspective, a lot of what we think is problematic is actually not problematic. Rather, we begin to realize we become so desensitized to the secular, disenchanted world that we live in that everything seems problematic. But when I take a step back and say, I'm sorry, listen, you're telling me this is how I should view the past. I don't accept that. You're telling me that science is the yardstick of all truth. Scientism is the way that we ought to go. I reject that. You don't accept religion. I reject that. So uh, just some parting advice, something that I find very comforting is two things. One, the same concerns that I have today, they're not new. Scholars of the past tackled them, but the way they tackled them was diametrically opposed to the way we tackled them. Their first concern was, we need to preserve this. We, this is true. How do we deal with it? And um, then they would, uh, from that background, they would go and tackle the question. And the second thing I wanted to say uh, as the final point, as I mentioned, let's not give in to certain, you know, worldviews. Let's not automatically assume that because um, religion is relegated to, you know, to, to the background for many people, I should do the same. No, my life will be defined by my faith because that's what's near and dear to me and if you find a faithless disenchanted world what you want to live in unfortunately i don't and when we take that approach uh hadith and islam in general becomes a lot easier to embody to imbibe and it becomes something i enjoy jazakallah khairan sheikh um before we end um i mentioned his blog and i'm gonna link it up here in the comments uh, hadithnotes.org. Uh, if you're interested in reading, definitely check it out. Uh, Sheikh Muntasir also um, speaks for, and he's involved 
with the Qalam Institute. So you can check out their website, see his programs, see their YouTube channel, uh, and see the content uh, that's out there of him. Uh, and I want to thank you, uh, Sheikh, for taking out the time uh, and giving us your valuable time. And uh, alhamdulillah, we learned a lot. Jazakallah khair, and it was a pleasure being on. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum.